Hello and welcome to Inside Syria. I'm Taymour Nabili. Turkey appealed to the UN Security Council on Thursday to create a safe zone inside Syria. Britain and France say they won't rule out any options, including a no-fly zone, to help people who are fleeing the war. But Turkey's leaders are holding out little hope for any endorsement from the UN, which so far has failed to take any action to stop the violence. Tens of thousands of civilians have been fleeing Syria into the neighboring countries, and Turkey believes around 100,000 refugees would mark a tipping point. With that threshold fast approaching, the government has proposed a solution. Ankara wants UN approval for a buffer zone for displaced Syrians, one that would stretch about 20 kilometers into Syrian territory. Now, France's foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, says so-called liberated zones have been identified, and he says that with proper funding and administration, they could serve as a refuge for civilians caught in the violence. But to be effective, a buffer zone would also need a no-fly zone to protect the area. And that can't be established without a UN Security Council resolution. Syria's President Bashar al-Assad has called the proposals for a buffer zone unrealistic so far. Turkey's Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu has warned this problem goes beyond an internal issue for Turkey. He says no one has the right to expect Turkey to take on this international responsibility on its own. According to OCHA, there are more than 2 million internally displaced people in Syria. In the face of such a humanitarian disaster, the UN should initiate the establishment of IDP camps within Syria without delay. Needless to say, these camps should have full protection. Let us also be clear. There is only one side which is responsible for this tra tragedy. It is the regime in Syria. Well, Britain's Foreign Secretary has said all options are on the table, but he's also said that caution is needed. We are excluding no option for the future. We do not know how this crisis will develop, how it will develop over the coming months. It is steadily getting worse. We're ruling nothing out, and we have contingency planning for a wide range of scenarios. We're not, uh, we don't generally go into what all that contingency planning is. But we also have to be clear that Anything like a safe zone requires military intervention. Um, and that, of course, um, is something that has to be weighed very carefully. Well, Turkey's Prime Minister, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has also echoed those sentiments. This is what he had to say. We cannot take such a measure unless the United Nations Security Council decides in favour of it. First, a decision for the no-fly zone must be taken. Then we would be able to take a step towards a buffer zone. Let me now introduce you to our guests on Inside Syria today. From Leicester in the UK, Hala Diab is a Syrian writer and a spokeswoman for the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria. From Atlanta in the US, Daniel Sowa is a professor at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And coming to us here in Doha is Birol Baskan. He is a professor of government at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Thank you all for being with us today. And Birol Baskan, let me begin with you, if I could. Now, Turkey's uh, suggestion of a buffer zone and um, a no-fly area is not new. We've heard talk like this before. But what they are talking about now is a tipping point, an imminent danger uh, of refugee problems. Is Turkey um, seriously concerned from a pragmatic perspective as what these refugees will what kind of problems they might cause in Turkey, or is this a, a political problem that they're trying to find a solution to? According to the Turkish official numbers, uh, the number of refugees is surpa surpassed 70,000, uh, and it's likely to increase in the, as the crisis in Syria escalates. Uh, such, taking care of such a big number of people, uh, of course, uh, puts a lot of burden on the uh, Turkish state budget. And uh, mm -hmm. rightly so, the Turkish government is, 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 is very concerned about, uh, about the situation. Uh, so there's a uh, budget concern. But also there's another uh, aspect of it is that uh, the, the place where the refugees are 
are, uh, are taken care of is, is, is mainly the province of Hatay, where there are a lot of uh, Arabs live and then they are pro-Assad. So uh, they, it seems that there are a lot of social unrest in the province of, uh, of, of Hatay, and then uh, it, 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 it might get out of control, which will, is going to put Turkey in a, uh, in a very uncomfortable position. But if Turkey's concern is, is budgetary more than anything else, and uh uh, and organizationally, why are they not asking for help from the international community uh, in terms of financial help, in terms of organizational help, to deal with the refugees rather than what they already recognize is a politically almost impossible solution, and that is buffer zones? Yes. Uh, I was just about to say that uh, there is another uh, dimension to the, to, the, to, to the problem, which is uh, the uh, ever strengthening and ever daring uh, Kurdish terrorist organization, the PKK, is inflicting uh, heavy damages on the on, uh, civilian and, and military population in, in, in Turkey. And then the Turkish armed forces are heavily preoccupied with the, with the PKK. And then the, uh, Turkey is, uh, is now uh, uh, looking at the crisis as if we are living another scenario that, that Turkey experienced in the 1990s, where when the Saddam forces in, the, in, in, in northern Iraq uh, uh, withdrew, uh, the, the, the Kurdish uh, PKK uh, found a heaven, safe haven in northern Iraq and then uh, began to operate. That's what's repeat, what, what seems to be repeating in, 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 in Syria. In, in the Kurdish region, the PKK has uh, social support. Uh, so there is a... What you're saying is there is a broader political perspective on this as well. Yes, All right, well, Hala Diab, let me ask you, as far as the suggestion of buffer zones is concerned, again, as I said to Birol, there is politically, internationally, almost no chance uh, of this happening, and particularly given the fact that uh, Bashar al-Assad is not particularly interested in going along with this either. Um, the refugees problem is not only Turkey uh, problem because as you know there are more than 120,000 Syrian refugees who flee Syria to Lebanon to Jordan to Turkey and even to Iraq and to other and even to Egypt the problem we have here is is more regional and political crises and I can't see in having a buffer zone in Syria will protect the refugees because we also have to think of how the Syrian Syrian citizen think inside Syria. For example, there are a lot of city in Syria, like uh, south of Syria, like Suwaida or Tartus or Latakia, which have not witnessed any political conflict. So uh, if the Syrians really feel safe to move from Damascus or Aleppo or Hama, which are the places of conflict, they could have moved to Latakia or to Tartus or to Suwaida if they really feel secured inside Syria. We have here a situation which is slightly different where the Syrian people are not feeling secure in their country even by having buffer zone I suspect that the Syrians will go to this zone because they don't feel secure so, so the only way is really to solve the problem of the refugees we have really raised the problem of ref refugees since the so what is the way to solve the problem of the started. refugees I, I think we need first to, to solve the problem of the Syrian crisis for more than 16 months. Have we? Uh, we always have this political analysis of, well, you of can Syria say that, as but if it's Syria not that easy, is only is it? about Assad. It is not easy, but we have to really put more efforts in order to solve the problem between the Syrian regime and between the opposition. Because Bashar al-Assad doesn't think of himself as the leader of Syria. He thinks of himself as the owner of Syria. And any invasion of his territory right. will cause him or will lead him to invade other, other territories. If Turkey we'll get on to the broader political in Syria, question in just a minute, Halad. Let me just interrupt you for a second there and just focus for a second longer on the issue of possible buffer zones and the kind of political and uh, no-fly implications that brings with it. Daniel Sowa, to you, um, apart from what seems to be the political reality of this can't happen anyway, why is it that with the US and the UK constantly talking about wanting to make a difference and helping the average Syrian, they aren't going to Turkey and saying, look, we will give you money to provide shelter, to provide refuge, to help the people that really need help, rather than what they've been doing, which is provide the rebels with the kind of equipment that's prolonging the, the conflict in the first place. Well, I don't think 
the lack of humanitarian assistance is a major factor here. There will be uh, support for whatever refugees arrive in Turkey. I, but it might, I think it might, the problem the, 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 really it's not is a problem the at the moment, for sure. But they're not providing humanitarian assistance. That's my point. Doesn't it? Doesn't it make more sense to answer Turkey's concerns? by allowing more cash and more humanitarian assistance for the refugee problem and solving that first before trying to solve the political problem? Well, I certainly think we should provide whatever is needed inside Turkey, but I priority should really go to the political problem. That's what's causing the refugee situation. You know, you don't want to simply feed and house refugees you could end up with half a million, with a million in, in, in Turkey. This would be an enormous burden to Turkey and, and wouldn't solve the problem that is creating the refugee flow. I think uh, it's a political problem inside Syria. I don't think a safe area within Syria does anything. Uh, it would be a target-rich environment that the regime would attack. Uh, I do think a no-fly zone would make a difference uh, inside Syria. It would change the military balance, but I see no sign right now that we're headed in that direction because it would require a Security Council resolution. There's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a uh, problem of trying to determine the cart and the horse on this specific issue. Hala, let me just come back to you quickly on this. Uh, obviously, everyone recognizes that the problem is a political one. But after 18 months of political um, absence of any progress at all, of complete gridlock, um, do you agree with Daniel that we should not even consider the refugees because our long-term aim of the political problem is the biggest priority? Um, I think that no flight zone uh, in Syria will not solve the problem and I do agree with that because we need to think also that Assad is not only use, using helicopters in order to attack his people but also there are you know people who are fighting on the streets against the rebels so how we will know that the, the civilians are safe even the Syrians I suspect that Syrian people feel safe inside Syria plus I think Turkey has political interest it's, it's for her interest to get involved in, in, in having buffer zone and, and, and by getting involved in Syria by having buffer, buffer zone the NATO will be involved because Turkey is part of the NATO and that will escalate the problem in Syria and no flight zone will not work as it is it worked in Libya because looking at the geographical situation and place demography of Syria is so different from Libya Assad has planted like all uh, uh, military organization and government organization within residential area so if any damage will happen to this uh, military organization that will also we will have lots of civilians who will be killed I think right. that will escalate the matter because Iran will get involved Hezbollah will get involved and Hezbollah was very clear that any harm will happen to Syria they will get involved and that will lead the whole region into a reg regional war and that's what what will affect the whole region Birol, the ramifications of a no-fly zone are, uh, as Hala described them, and obviously not um, alien to the government in Turkey. So tell us how they are weighing their interests uh, and their perspectives here. Do they really think that a no-fly zone will help them? No-fly zone, uh, as uh, Hana uh, uh, pointed out, I guess it's going to give an excuse to Turkey to make uh, military operations in northern uh, north uh, eastern part of Syria especially against the against the PKK as Recep Tayyip Erdogan the prime minister of Turkey said Turkey is not going to take a unilateral action here uh, because Erdogan is having uh, some domestic problems regarding uh, why Turkey uh, is already heavily involved in Syrian affairs there's a very strong powerful opposition against Turkey involvement in Arab politics anyway that that was not really Turkish historical position as far as you know uh, since the Atatürk uh, the founding uh, father of the uh, Turkish Republic so Erdogan really changed the, the the Turkish foreign policy towards Syria and the Arab world and Turkey is heavily involved and a lot of people in Turkey are questioning this uh, this whether this is wise or not so Erdogan is having already a kind of a dominant domestic uh, issue of whether this is a smart decision for Turkey. Uh, but as I said, uh, the, the PKK is getting uh, ground uh, in northern Iraq, in, in northern Syria. 
attacks. They are inflicting heavy damages on Turkish civilian and military populations. Uh, and Turkey uh, seems to be incapable of acting unilaterally against PKK and uh, making military incursions in, 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 in Syria. Okay. So uh, military zone uh, might give an excuse to, 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 to Turkish military to expand its military operations into, into, into northern Syria. Hala, I can see that you want to say something, but let me just uh, ask you to pause for a minute and uh, get Daniel to have a word on this because he may add some perspective to that as well. Daniel, is um, a no-fly zone under any circumstances, can it be part of the political solution that you are saying is essential? Or would a no-fly zone um, lead to the kind of chaos that Hala was predicting? First, let me emphasize that I in no way suggest that we should ignore the humanitarian problem. But we can't give exclusive emphasis to that because uh, if we do, we will encourage more refugees rather than fewer. Uh, the political problem inside Syria is, a, is proving highly intractable, and I do think there is a, a serious worry in any event about spreading the conflict in the region. Hezbollah, Iran are already very much engaged inside Syria, and I don't, uh, 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 they can get more engaged, but I don't think that uh, that's an excuse for not doing uh, more support to the opposition in Syria. The question is whether a no-fly zone would help the opposition in Syria. I think it probably would, but I don't think it's politically possible under current circumstances because of Russian and Chinese opposition, particularly Russian opposition. And the Americans, because they need Russia for the talks with Iran on nuclear issues, because of Afghanistan, uh, the Americans are not prepared to uh, buck the Russians on this right now. So just to be clear, what you're saying is that you think that uh, a no-fly zone could actually be a stepping stone towards a useful political solution were it to pass the UN Security Council. It wouldn't necessarily lead us to, but for instance, I'd a Libya situation that people had feared. No, I don't. Uh, I think a no-fly zone of the Libyan sort is not in the cards at all. When you think no-fly zone, you should think northern Iraq under Saddam Hussein rather than uh, rather than Libya. All right. We didn't go after Saddam Hussein uh, at, at when when we had a no-fly zone in northern Iraq. Hala. Yeah, I want to come back to the idea that we always compare Syria to Libya or to Iraq, but we have here a, a country which has more complexity within its the fabric of the society, the fabric of its politics. For 16, more than 16, 17 months, nothing really cracked down the army and the power of Syrian regime in Syria. That shows there are a lot into what's happening in Syria than just you know what happened in Iraq or what happened in Libya, and even the scenario what happened in Iraq. Look at Iraq and what happened uh, after the war. So we don't want to have this in Syria because there is a lot of uh, 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 diverse people. There are Alawites, Sunnis, Shia, Armenians, Kurds in Syria. And I think the only solution is to have a transitional, peaceful uh, uh, solution where Assad should go uh, come into in terms with the opposition. But the problem we have in Syria, the oppositions are divided. Even the Syrian council, uh, 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 they are divided with themselves. Every day we see one of their members quit the council. So how come even the Syrian people will have faith in, in, in the future Syria? I think that the whole problem is very complicated, but when we involve more military intervention or a flight zone or buffer zone, that will escalate the problem. And the, the, the first step to really decrease the problem is to stop violence from the opposition side and from the Syrian regime side. And maybe dialogue between both sides will lead Syria to a better situation than it is now. We are all the time thinking of Syria as it's only about one man. It's about the army. It's about the rebels, mm. about the Syrian army. What's about the Syrian people? What about mothers? What about the children? What about youth who have not been to school for 16 months? People who don't go to work? Mothers who are losing their children right, but who, and who would be involved in this fleeing. dialogue? Because neither side seems particularly interested in, in um, engaging. 
with the international community. I think uh, 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 UK and USA should pressure Saudi Arabia and Qatar in order to have more pressure on the opposition and the rebels, not only by supporting them with arms and escalating the military and the situation in Syria, but also to have a dialogue with Assad. Okay. On the other hand, Russia, uh, Iran, and, and uh, 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 China can also uh, uh, help in order to open dialogue between the opposition and the regime. Daniel, you were suggesting that uh, the, the opposition should be armed even further and supported even more, whereas Allah seems to be suggesting that... No, actually I didn't mean to be... Go ahead. I didn't mean to be suggesting that at all. I think what Hala is saying is a possible exit from the current situation, and if, it, if that possibility could be opened, uh, I think it would be extremely important. Isn't the it the U.S. that's preventing that from happening? That because, sorry to interrupt, I mean, we had the non-aligned movement um, in, in Tehran only this week, uh, at which Mohamed Morsi confounded everybody's expectations and uh, came out against President Assad. But what he did say was exactly the same thing. We need a dialogue that involves partners that the U.S. refuses to deal with. Right. And uh, well, well I think uh, the U.S. is neither here nor there. The real problem is the opposition and Assad neither of which appears to want a real dialogue. At this point, that task of creating that dialogue is in the hands of uh, Brahimi. And uh, we right. have to wait and see what he's able to accomplish. Birol, uh, from a Turkish perspective, their relationship with Iran has actually been reasonably good in relative terms. Um, does Turkey believe that Iran has a role to play in a political solution to the Syria situation? Well, uh, since the coming to power of the Justice and Development Party, Turkey ha has tried to uh, keep a healthy distance between Iran on the one hand and the Arab world on the other hand, uh, and developed really good relations with, with, with both sides, uh, developing trade relations, cultural relations, political relations. I should remind you that Turkey has been the, uh, had been the greatest supporter of Iranian nuclear uh, even program at the risk of uh, uh, you know, putting its relations with the Arab world and, and the US and Israel at risk. So, uh, but what happened, uh, I guess Arab Spring changed this environment, which was very conducive to, 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 to Turkey developing relations with both mm. sides. Uh, Turkey, I guess, had to make a choice between Iran on the one hand and an Arab world on the other hand. Uh, and until the shooting down of the Turkish fighter uh, by the Syria, Turkey has not made, had not made that change. Turkey's position towards Syria had been ambivalent, uh, trying to persuade Assad to make reform, but at the same time uh, supporting logistically, at least opening ground for the uh, Turkish opposition, in, sorry, Syrian opposition in Turkey to organize, to help meet, hold meetings, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, but uh, now, especially after the shooting down of the fighter, I guess it was a uh, wrong decision by, the, by Syria, okay. Turkey had to make a choice, and then uh, Turkey made the choice in favor of the Arab world. Turkey is now with the Arab world, and I don't think that Turkey has any leverage with Iran regarding... Uh, all right, well, well, I'll have to stop you there. We're coming to the end of the show. I just want to end with one final question to all three of you, and that is, given Turkey's latest comments, given William Hague's comments and Laurent Fabius's comments that we mentioned earlier on the show, have we moved any closer towards a political solution to this? Daniel So, are you first? No, I don't believe so. I think, uh, I think we're at a stalemate. I think the militarization of the conflict has been a colossal mistake, both from the point of view of mm -hmm. Assad and from the point of view of the opposition. Uh, I, I don't have much hope for the political solution, but it is clearly the better course. Okay. Hala, very quickly. Um, I, I think that's a delegation from international communities and from the Arab leaders, political leaders, uh, to get involved, to go to Syria and really try to establish or to do a dialogue between the opposition and the, and the Syrian regime in order to come to terms to, to, to finish this Syrian crisis. Okay. That would be much better to put efforts in arming the rebels or even to have a war in, Bir in Syria. Birol, one sentence. Has Turkey moved any closer to his solving its refugee problem? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the, the refugee problem uh, is going to uh, increase in intensity and uh, I don't think as long as this conflict uh, escalates, uh, Turkey will uh, continue to face uh, uh, this problem and that's unfortunate.
And that's all we have time for in Leicester. Thank you to Hala Diab in Atlanta, Daniel Sowa, and here in Doha, Birol Baskan. And thank you for watching the programme. And on the hour, round the clock, Al Jazeera's coverage of the situation in Syria continues. And there's also plenty of background and analysis at our website, aljazeera.com. You can watch this programme again on that site as well. But for the moment, that's it from me, Taymour Nabini. See you again next week when we'll have another look inside Syria. Bye for now.